Hi everyone and welcome to the show. This is a very special guest as we have officially marked our 80th voice actor guest. Yes, 80 different voice actors, not 80 different interviews. We've had over 100 interviews with voice actors, but our 80th different voice actor on the show as our guest. And we are not slowing down. Officially, we've had 80 voice actors, 60 authors, and 18 composers. Um, there are other categories I could put things in from comic book artists and so on, but those are the biggest ones. And our 80th guest is a big one. So, Zach, why don't you do your thing and introduce our 80th voice actor guest. Jingling bells herald in Christmas spirit as a red and gold clad superhero zooms across the sky. Vivid realizations of the planet Cybertron clashes of Autobot and Decepticon. Brave Turian soldiers resisting the scourge of Reaper domination. These are but a few of the glorious panoramas that preceded the arrival of our latest guest. We are graced today by the incomparable presence of none other than Mr. Daniel Reardon. A man whose talents and contributions to voiceover artistry span decades, mediums, and genres. Might you be a fan of the 90s Christmas classic Jingle All The Way? Our guest is none other than the one who lent his voice to Turbo Man. Were you raised on a steady media diet of battling robots native to Cybertron? If so, you've Mr. Reardon to thank for his impeccable renditions of Megatron, Galvatron, and Omega Prime in Transformers Robots in Disguise. Do you remember the sweeping cinematic shots of Palavan as the mighty Turian fleet struggled to fight the Reaper menace in Mass Effect 3? Do you know who it was that greeted your Commander Shepard as Primarch Adrian Victus. Why, yes, it was Mr. Daniel Victor. So it is with the realization that we could continue to list his achievements and contributions, for they are many and mighty, that we beckon our latest guest into our hallowed halls. We extend you the warmest of greetings. Welcome, Mr. Reardon, to the Thanatarium. You know, one reason why we wanted to talk to you specifically is, uh, you know, I actually let my son, who's the five-year-old, pick a kind of our topic of episodes we're doing for the summer, and he said we have to talk big giant robots and Transformers. And yeah. you happen to be a voice of a rather important Transformer in the show he is currently watching right now uh, uh, on, I think, Tubi TV or whatever it's on right now, and that being right. Transformers, Robots in Disguise, where you got to be Megatron slash Galvatron. Um, in the English dub of, I believe it was originally an anime. Yeah, it was anime. Uh, we dubbed it from the Japanese uh, over many, many sessions for uh, Saban oh. Entertainment the, in Burbank. The Digimon Power Rangers guys. Right. They had bought the uh, rights to the to the product uh, for U.S. release, and then we were the ones who did all the uh, uh, the dubbing. So when you said you had to do a lot of sessions, was that more because of voice matching or because they, when they translate it, they have to kind of change dialogue quite a bit when it's animated to English because voice because sentence structure is different and they kind of they, you know, well, they, they adapt it. For, yeah, kind of all of the above. For one reason, there were many episodes. So as you know, it's a it's uh, thirty episodes, forty episodes, fifty. Uh, forty two seasons. I think they split in two seasons of twenty. So yeah, forty or so. Yeah, it's it's a fair amount. So there was that, and then um, yes, uh, because it was Japanese, uh, and they were dubbing loosely to the script as much as they could. But sometimes, what they'd find is that the voice ma the the lip match wasn't working with the voice, and then it was really interesting because right in the moment, the the director would rewrite it. So we would rewrite it in the session so that we'd match up. So if the word needed to be changed, but it was the same general idea. But it was a better match for the for the for the mouth movement. Then they would do that. So, you know, we did a lot of that, and uh, you know, working with uh, trying to match, you know, because I, I I had it on the screen as I was doing it, so I was able to look and see some of some of the you know trying to match some of the even if you could extend a vowel here or hit a consonant harder there, you know, it helped. And wasn't this? Uh, like done just before the company that did this got sold to Disney. I want to say Disney took over like right after this anime was done. I, I, I believe so because Saban Entertainment, I mean, he's a pretty big player, uh, Saban. Uh, and he has also Saban Television right now. 
And I'm, I wouldn't be surprised. I'm not, I'm not sure that sounds, that sounds familiar to me. Yes. Um, I think it would have happened after, after we did it for sure. Cause I know they got D- Digimon right after, I don't know, season three or four. They kind of chunk that show up in a weird ways, but I know D- D- Disney got hold of Digimon and that was a Saban big one too. So it, it sounds about right. Um, yeah. And, and, and it's, it's about around the time that D- Disney was busy acquiring that kind of product. So. So when you play in this one, you played Megatron slash Galvatron, a mm-hmm. character which has a, a little bit of baggage, um, with a lot of big people having played that character uh, over the years. You know, lots right. of big actors have played that character. When when you were uh, auditioned for this role or given this role, did you have any either uh, notions in mind what you wanted to do or instructions given to you for how to do it, or did you just have free reign to be, you know make this character yours this time around? And they said yes or no. Yeah, I, I think it was uh, more I had free reign. I certainly didn't have any of the other actors in my in my head when I did it. And I think the the reference um, was something like, um, you know, scary, you know, commanding, evil, you know, robot overlord sort of voice. Nice. It was something it was something general like that. That was the spec on it. So um, I just came in with what I I kind of thought sounded right um and i i may have listened to other other um uh, other shows other uh, you know i I might, I might have been in the general ballpark of of how of how that those characters were done but pretty much no i think i, I think i pretty much went in pretty clean pretty fresh i usually do because sometimes it doesn't help like you know i did alduin I, i'm alduin in skyrim as well the dragon. Yeah. So uh, that was also um, the same kind of thing where uh, they had their own language. And I think I was able to, to hit that language really well. I know they were really excited at the callback when I did that. So um, it's those kinds of things I think that get you booked, but no, I, I had, I didn't have the other actors in mind. Cause I can say, you know, my son is obsessed with transformers. And so he's watched basically all of them. And your show came out in between the run that David K did with, Beast Wars, Beast Machines, and then he did the series that came right after yours with Armada and so on. And my son prefers your voice to that one because he said that one's a bit more um, high pitched, squealy, while oh, yours was he he liked it more. But you know, and then you know he his ultimate favorite I think is the Corey Burton one that happened way later. But he likes every Transformer show ever made, and so it's <laughs> like half the time he doesn't realize it's a different person doing it. So which is a good thing, you know. He just knows the, <laughs> he knows the characters versus you know the voices i think frank welker does it a lot of the time too yeah uh you know i went to the tf nation um convention in, in england last summer they asked me to come over and uh and sign some artwork and and and, and you know be on a speaking forum and talk about the character and, and whatnot and a lot of uh, the fans came up and said that they uh that was their preferred version of megatron nice. but i guess it's all a matter, of, a matter of personal taste i know that i'm ranked on IMBD or, or, or voice actors, uh, the website, um, uh, I'm, I'm kind of ranked like two or three or something is most favorite. But, I mean, there's other people that are that are more popular or more favorite, but I'm I'm up there with the, proud to be proud to be up there with the the best. Yeah, because you know <laughs> what, one advantage, of course, David Kay and Frank Welker have is they've done the voice for a lot more shows. Exactly, people have heard it more, but. You know Trevor Duvall and what Fred Tattashore and others have done it too, and you're you're mm-hmm. definitely higher than those ones. Which you know, just saying, it's a it's a it's a great character to have a, on your resume. Yeah, it is, and people just really really love it. And it was fun because I always enjoyed playing the character because he was just he was evil, but he was always really smart. I always felt like he was like the coolest character on the show. You know, the other guys, uh, uh, the you know the Autobots and what not. You know, they, they didn't have the same the same kind of depth I felt. I always played it like he was really smart, you know, yeah. even though he was evil. And, I had... yeah, and, and that's the key for the characters. You know, Megatron is a really smart one because you have all these other characters like Starscream to like trying to take over, but it, it, they don't, it never actually ends up working very well for that. Right. They're more lackeys, you know, like in the classic hoodlum sense, you know, they're like, they're like the, the, the muscle, you know, and then, um, then you have, um, you know, the good guys, and they all have their tonality that's very, you know, kind of classic American stentorian 
which is also fun. Uh, I actually played one of those other roles too. Uh, kind of. I know you played uh, Omega Prime. I think it's on my list right here. Exactly. That's right. Thank you. And you know, of course, when it comes to the good guys, pretty much it's you know, is someone going to be Bumblebee or Optimus Prime, and if it's not Bumblebee or Optimus Prime, they just kind of fall in a different category of okay, that's 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 everyone else on the Autobot side. So yeah, you kind of have to stand. You have to just kind of sound heroic. Yeah, I was you know kind of uh, classic American heroic, you know, leader. Uh, Forceful, square-jawed, you know. <laughs> forceful, square-jawed, tr- transforming robots. Exactly. That has made it so now whenever my son sees any robot, he tries to transform it before he realizes, no, this is not a tr- – that, that, that is a Gundam. Do not tra- – nope, don't do that. <laughs> yeah, you don't want to bring it into an expensive uh, collector's uh, shop. <laughs> but when it comes to your resume, though, you talk about going to the Transformer Con, which you know, sounds mm-hmm. like it was a lot of fun because – Transformers fans, oh boy, they. I, there was a kid I met who I work in middle school. He um, mm-hmm. he has um, some some mental challenges, but he can sit in there and tell me every like. For example, he had a session where he came in there and told me the name of every Transformer in order of appearance from every Michael Bay movie, like from the beginning to the end, every single mm-hmm. one, who they were, what they were doing, and the plot of the movie from you know movie one through five without breathing. It's like, yes. I, I can't even figure out who half of them are, let alone in order I would of say appearance. About, about half of the fans that came up to me in England were exactly that guy. Wow. So there was a lot of people where this is really a big deal, and uh, their mind works in, in an interesting way, and they're really detail-oriented and very, very, very big on numbers and, and, and stats and and uh, just rattling them off, but so excited and then i would uh you know post for pictures with them or one girl she really wanted uh to even talk more but she was so it was so hard for her to like make eye contact and and talk but her father later came up and said how how thrilled she was and then i saw her in the hotel uh, uh restaurant the next morning having breakfast and i ran upstairs and got a uh, a picture that she hadn't gotten yet. She, you know, she, they bought like one or two things and, and I had some others, uh, some other artwork and I went up and grabbed it and, and gave it to her. And, uh, you know, it was, nice. <laughs> it was pretty, it, it was, it was pretty fun, you know, to see her reaction. Her dad was really touched, but she was, they're just really dedicated fans, you know, and know all the details. No, much more than I do. That's, yeah. that's for sure. Well, and that's what makes conventions like that fun when you get to make the fans happy. It's much more fun to have the fans happy than have the, the people that just want, you know, to get your signature and then sell it on eBay right after that. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And, and I, I always feel that when you're, when you're working in conventions that deal with, you know, any kind of sci-fi or fantasy or superheroes or, and I've done a lot of these different characters is that, um, you know, the sincerity and the wholesomeness and the, and the love of that genre is so sincere. It makes you rise to the occasion. I mean, I'm really there to serve the fan. You know, I'm there to, to just, uh, to really, it's, it's my form of saying thank you because you realize how many people are affected by it, you know, by your performance. And they tell you this. They tell you that, you know, and sometimes it was, I was taken aback a bit, you know, how, you know, certain episodes of, of certain shows or certain characters I played help them get through a rough patch in their life or help them understand uh, an aspect of life or their personality better. I mean, it was it was kind of crazy, but it was also very flattering. And, you know, and as we think, Transformers is far from the only show that people would know you from as far as fandoms, you know, because you've been in three different Star Trek TV shows. Um, and Star Trek fans definitely can pick out individual people in episodes that you exactly. people might oh not have remembered being in, but yep, they know who you are. Exactly. Um, and oh my you've, gosh. Yeah. And you've, you've been in Avatar The Last Airbender, which is another huge fan favorite, no matter what Nickelodeon tries to do with those shows, or not exactly. do, I guess. <laughs> 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 um, but you've also been in, you know, Dungeons & Dragons properties. You've mm-hmm. been in, um, you know, like Age of Empires stuff. Uh, you've been in Skyrim, as you mentioned, Mass Effect, um, Final Fantasy. You've been in mm-hmm. Diablo. You've been in a lot of franchises that people love. Yeah, and I'm in um, Days Gone now. And just, you were in uh, Spider-Man recently. As, you know, just talking about Yuri Lowenthal a little bit ago. You were in that Spider-Man game. 
Oh yeah, that's right. You no, know, I play the uh, detective. Right? Yeah, and uh, you know, lot, there's lots of great stuff. Like, I, I, I do have uh, you know some listeners that were sending in some questions, and you know, um, you know, one of them wants to, one of them wants to know, you know, you've been in the the industry for a long time, you've right. seen the industry through its shifts, and of course, it's more recent ones to try to get more fair treatment, especially in video games with stunts and so on. When you guys went on um, on strike. And I believe today, actually, there was a big uh, SAG after a deal announced with Netflix, which you know, is a, it's an awesome Correct. thing. Yeah, um, I read that paper today. Um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, uh, it's great that they make some movement. Uh, I don't know how big of a, of a you know, how, how big that's going to be, but it's it's nice that they're at least moving in that direction. But you know, the the, the question he wants to know is, you know, um, you, you've seen the the voice acting transition into the modern thing do you foresee them staying as their own entity as just voice actors or is it going to transition in your mind to something more where they have to combine with actor you know with the actors guild themselves or how do you see the transition continuing in the best circumstances not mm. since yeah in the best circumstances how do you see this transition continuing as voice actors really try to make their their imprint well it, it's a couple of things number one is most of us are already in sag after so and and most of the jobs we do are union. I mean, all the big jobs anyway are are all definitely union. And I I I pretty much only I've only worked union jobs. Um, so that there's already that connection to the union. We're seen as talent or actors with. There's a division within the union that's, uh, you know, interactive and voice acting, et cetera, et cetera. And we have separate contracts, which I actually sat on the board. On in, in 2005, I was on the interactive board trying to get residuals for games at that time. And that would be the future, ultimately, is if what's happened uh, with streaming services and also with uh, different platforms, the, the plethora of new media platforms, is that the actor's base for residuals has been eroded. So in the old days, when it was just three networks, we got really good residuals. You know, we received uh, really good compensation for the show. And then each time you worked on a network show, your quote went up. So there was a thing called a TVQ and that moved up through uh, each audition, each job. So you were kind of uh, accruing a better pay rate as you went along. And then, of course, you got really great residuals. Uh, the average actor in 1970, uh, the average commercial a TV commercial paid uh, fifty thousand dollars in 1970 like fifty thousand in 1970 was what the average actor was making for a tv commercial well you know most actors will be lucky to get that now or or that's you'd have to do a, it'd have to air like crazy i mean there's not there's just because of uh the internet and because of all the new media platforms the there has been a, a lessening of the pay rate and certainly uh, there are no uh, contractual obligations to pay, you know, residuals. So the thing with Netflix is what they're trying to do is they're getting a little foothold, little foothold for residuals. But the other side of that is it said it made it easier for Netflix also to um, to uh, what was it to take longer to to pay or longer to cast the shows. I forgot there was some there was something they had to kind of give up also for Netflix to make it easier for them. And at the end of the day, I think. Um, if we are not compensated fairly, uh, you know, for, for the amount of work that we, we do and, and the quality we bring to the shows, it's going to become more like a hobby. You know, it's hard yeah. to make a living. It'll be hard to make a living. Yeah. So people like Yuri or even myself can, can, we've worked a long time. We can make a living, but we're still looking at, um, you know, there's a there's less and less commercial copy for voiceover because more and more of it is 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 going away and people are TVing and using streaming services. So, to answer that, I, I've gone a kind of a long winded way, but I guess to answer that question, the future of voice acting, ideally, would be more of a a, a fairly compensated um, endeavor. So there, there would if I know the I know the um, game companies do not want to pay residuals or royalties but then there has to be maybe bigger upfront fees uh if they're going to be buyouts they have to be more sizable because i think at the end of the day there's just not um there's just not enough money in it to sustain a young career you know if someone's coming into it and a lot of the young people that are coming into it now are also willing to work non-union or for a hundred dollars or 
you know, uh, and they're, they're, they're trying to get cast off the internet and, and they're willing to do that to start out. And, and in the end that kind of undercuts everybody. So yeah, it's a complicated question. I don't want to sound too negative because I love what I do and I really respect the creators and, and the people that are uh, writing and producing the work. It tends to come more from the corporate level because a lot of these corporations did not start in entertainment. They started as tech companies or like Comcast. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, but you know, this makes sense because you know, we've talked about this over the years. I'm um, like, uh, I remember an interview we had with um, Jeff Nimoy, who's, you know, does a lot of anime stuff. And you were saying that with anime, especially when you dub, you don't get the residuals anyway, because it's a, it's a dub. And that, right. and that contract was negotiated in, I think he said, 99 and hasn't changed since. And, you know, the world has changed a lot in 20 years. But for them, they have to, like with him and, like, uh, Richard Epcar, which I know helped direct some of the episodes um, mm -hmm. of Transformers that you're on, he, you know, you have to write, direct, voice act. You have to kind of do everything um, to make ends meet because you have to wear lots of hats because that's how you can make the money to, you know, exactly. survive. Exactly. And, uh, and, and that's... That's something that we were trying to deal with in 2005. It was the, I always said it was the thin edge of the wedge. If we had been able to get um, uh, residuals uh, attached to uh, interactive act work, vo voiceover work at that point, it would have set a precedent for all new media. And we knew that. We were the first on the line to actually have to deal with that issue. And we saw the way it was coming, that streaming and platforms, and these new media platforms were going to come along and they were going to sidestep the traditional venues. And, and, and unfortunately SAG made a mistake way back. Uh, it's, it's, it's actually really kind of classic. It tells you a lot about technology for a long time. The contracts were based on whether you were being shot on film or whether you were on television. And when cable came along, cable was a new medium um, and it wasn't quite broadcast television. And there were also uh, DVDs, uh, not DVDs, but uh, VHS tapes of, of movies and TV shows. And all of that was new technology, quote unquote. So it wasn't the contracts weren't based as they should have been on performance, on the fact that you are a narrative storyteller, you are a narrative actor, uh, you know, working in a narrative format. It doesn't matter what technology it is, you know, um, no matter how you're being recorded, it's the same thing as what you were doing all these years on film and on broadcast television. And instead, um, the producers came and said, well, you know, it's a new technology. Give us a break, uh, especially with cable. They said, you know, let's let's not use the same um, you know, residual format as we were using on network television. If it, if, it, if it's a go, if it looks like it's going to work out, we'll come back and renegotiate. And the union, for some reason, said, yeah, OK, instead of saying, well, that's it doesn't matter. That's apples and oranges. Who cares? You know, let's just keep it the same percentage and we'll rise and fall with you, you know. So that was how that started. So with every new iteration of technology, there's no contract to cover it. So each time SAG has to go back in and try to try to get them to pay, uh, try to create a contract that, that actually gets them to pay some sort of a re residual, residual, uh, to pay, to pay residuals. And it, it, they've resisted along the line and each one has to be crafted individually. So it's become a real problem. Um, and the only way you can really force them to do it is by striking. And then there's a real problem with that because it's it's very damaging to people's livelihoods. And there's always the chance that they will go outside the union completely. And this is the threat and, and hire non-union people. And there are a lot of talented people on the Internet that are looking for a break that would be happy to fill those spots and work for much, much less. And, you know, maybe just do it temporarily. And, you know, so it's 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 a lot of things. I think the ultimately the way that uh, it's going to change, if there's any change, is that the people that are actually building the games, the, the, the tech sector, the actual uh, uh, programmers, the artists, the, the people that are working for EA, uh, for example, um, they are starting to organize or wanting to organize. And if they organize... And the un our union has been very interested in supporting that. If they organize and we were to combine forces, then you could truly shut something down uh, in a way that they'd have to deal with you. They'd have to create a contract that was equitable.
But I don't know if that's going to happen, and I don't know when that's going to happen. But I, there are rumblings in that direction because those people also are being, uh, you know, exploited to a certain degree. Yeah. So. Well, let's hope we we get some movement in that front without having to go striking, because as we said, you know, that that does hurt some people's livelihood, and it's help reason. Well, it's help reasonable people. <laughs> yeah. Come, exactly. Come together that's... and do something. Mm -hmm. So it's it's it's. I basically just try to stay very positive and, and do my work and, um, you know, just try to enjoy life and, and, and not worry about it too much. But uh, but it is it is disheartening if you've been in the business for a long time and you see that you're actually the potential to make money is actually less than when you started. Yeah, I work in schools and if my pay went down from year to year, I, I wouldn't do it. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> um, exactly. But, you know, you, you worked in Transformers in 2000 for the Robots in Disguise show, but it's not the only time you worked in Transformers. You went back in 2007 for Transformers the game, where you got right. to voice some other characters like Bone Crusher and Shockwave rather than Megatron this time. Uh, what was it like trying to return into the Transformers skin, so to speak, for another go-around? Well, it was it, it was fun because I, I love the world of Transformers and I love their they kind of have a, a you know a certain sound and a very direct sort of fun energized uh, way of speaking and, and acting and so it's it, I like to do that kind of acting I like that kind of energy so it was fun to do a different character it was fun to do Bone Crusher and get you know darker and you know a little grittier and um, so I I liked it very much. So when it comes to Transformers voices, I'm, I'm, I, I've heard Peter Cullen. Okay, I, I know his voice. But how much of that voice is you guys versus what they can do in you know in the mechanical um, filters they can put in in post? How much is actual like your guys' voice? Well, I think most of it is our voice. Um, they do do they can uh, you know alter it in post and color it in post and deepen it or whatever. But for example, if I do this right now. You will be destroyed. You know, that's fairly close to what you're going to hear. I mean, they might give it a little more bass and maybe a little more echo or something. But, you know, that's you start with that. You have to start with that. And in the auditions, they always say, don't put anything on it, you know, to to the agency. So they never want the agency to, to doctor it in any way. Nice. And, uh, you know, you've got to play, if you if you just look at the names of roles that you've played, you know, you've got to play some gods with Age of Mythology, which is a game that's getting a 4K really soon, and I, I, I love that game. Um, you mean the, the, um, the, yeah, the... Age of Mythology, the, we got to do, like, the, the Greek gods, the Atlantis right. gods, Egyptian gods, Norse, that was a, that game is just a blast, and uh, it's my favorite of the Age my games. first jobs, I think. Yeah, it was actually yeah. pretty early for your voice work. It was, uh... That way, that game came out just after Robots in Disguise. Right. So, yeah, that was pretty early. Because I started doing voice in the late 90s, like really late 90s, like 98, 99. Yeah. Um, I do find it funny, though, when uh, – so I posted, you know, that you're going to be on the show. And Wikipedia says, he is most known for being super made in Jingle All the Way. You know, this is <laughs> – Somebody went into my Wikipedia and, and, and sabotaged me. And I don't know why, <laughs> but, but, uh, yeah, it's, uh, I, I, you know, I'm, I'm Turbo Man and Jingle all the way. Yeah. Um, my son actually was, went, he got upset about it. He went back in and, and, and reported it and tried to straighten it out. And they, I don't know what happened. I thought they straightened it out, but yeah, my Wikipedia used to be really, uh, exact and, and pretty lengthy. And then it, I don't know, it turned into this weird thing. <laughs> Well, so we put that up, and everyone, you know, and so fans do what fans do, and, you know, they corrected things. Um, and then they're like, wait, but he's also been Megatron. He's also in Mass Effect. That's automatically better than a movie that only 90s kids remember. Um, right. And, you know, I, I enjoy Jingle all the way, but, you know, I remember, you know, Jake Lloyd. Well, we've had Jake Lloyd on the show, but, you know, I remember Jake Lloyd before he was in Star Wars and, you know, Arnold when he tried to do kids' movies. Um, mm -hmm. <laughs> it, right. was, it was a very different time, but you know, you've as far as fans go, you know, Megatron's a, kind of a bigger name. But the fact that you've been in Star Trek in general, or mm -hmm. you know, Mass Effect, where you're, uh, where you're Primarch Victus, which is a game I was actually playing a couple days ago, that exact mission where Victus comes, and uh, um, you know, that that's a very big name as well. And you know, Skyrim mm -hmm. has been released. Well, it's never not released nowadays. It's it's you know so that's another really really big one. But so I have a, I have a listener though who wants to know though, 
in video games, we have Western game companies like Blizzard, um, right. EA, and so on, and you have Japanese-based ones, you know, like Square Enix, and so on. When mm -hmm. you go in to do voice work for, say, Mass Effect with you know that crew mm -hmm. in Edmonton, um, is there a difference between working on that type of high-level AAA project versus working on, say, Lightning Returns, Final Fantasy XIII, where you're working with Square Enix, or is it a job's a job, and you're still this. It's the same process, no matter which uh, you know side of the world you're you're working with. Well, I think it's the same process. I mean, in terms of you try to give it your all, and 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 you you know you do your very best work, and um, and you try to bring as much as you can to it in terms of your acting and character, and and really respecting the material is number one. You've really got to respect it. You've got to. I've always said you've got to treat voice work like you're doing Shakespeare or Chekhov. You know, it's not. Yeah. You can't treat it as, as, a, as, as a second class citizen in any way. But I will say there is a difference a little bit in the um, between the Eastern and the Western uh, games is that uh, some of the Eastern games tend to be a little more philosophical, maybe spiritual slash spiritual in their uh, approach towards the universe. So even though it's kind of this trippy sci fi you know, fantasy world, there tends to be almost sort of a, you know, they, I think they're pulling on their own traditions. So there's maybe a little bit of Zen, uh, you know, philosophy there or Taoism or, you know, sort of a, it's got a different, uh, it's, 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 it's not like you're doing an accent that would betray you as being, let's say, you know, a non-Asian trying to be Asian or something like that, but but it has a sensibility where you have, you come at it from a different angle, where maybe you're a little more, um, you know, monk-like or thinking ab about it in a, in a more classical way than some of the other Western stuff. I see, and um, you know, another one is you know we this whole. Um show started with uh honestly star wars and you've worked on you know star wars the old republic which mm -hmm. i like to joke around going if you're a voice actor you've probably worked on that game because that game has so the voice cat that the list for voice work now in that game over the years is huge right it might be the longest list i've ever seen for <laughs> anything it just keeps on going and going and going but you know you've got to work in that universe which of course which was ea um, you've got to work with Blizzard quite a bit with uh, StarCraft, Diablo, World of Warcraft. I believe you worked with all of them. Um, so you know, one listener wants to know is, you know, with all these different games you've worked on, what is the role that comes to mind that you just had a lot of fun with? Not necessarily it was the best written or the most engaging, but it's one that you had permission to let loose and just have fun. Um, well, Alduin was a lot of fun. Playing Alduin for Skyrim. Definitely. Um, Megatron was a lot of fun. I really, because I, I think basically I did so many episodes too. So I was able to, to really make it my own. And that was fun. Um, the, uh, the game that just came out, do you know this game Days Gone? It just came out? Yes. Right. Um, and it I just came I, out with um, Sam Witwer as the main character, I believe. Correct. And I'm like one of the main characters. I play the evil Colonel. Oh, yes. Who's kind of his nemesis. He starts out being his friend and then turns out to be kind of a, you know, a, kind of an evil or at least, uh, um, you know, kind of a mad, you know, um, person. But uh, I, that character was a lot of fun. And that was mocap as well. So mocap is, is interesting, I think, because it gives you a lot more to work with. And it's like doing theater in the round. So I did theater in the round in New York when I was you know, starting acting and. Um, even before that. And so when you do mocap, you're on a completely white soundstage with, you know, multiple cameras and you're using, you know, square boxes for tables and, and, uh, chairs. And, you know, it's very, very abstract. And, and then we're let free. We're allowed to move pretty much freely, uh, and, and block ourselves, at least in the beginning, the first run through. So there, that to me is really exciting because it, you're, it's like you're doing live theater and, uh, and you can move anywhere you want and they, they're going to catch you. So, um, I really enjoyed that role playing the Colonel. Have you also been able to do, uh, you know, the facial capture instead of, you know, with a, the more mild version of mocap where it's just your face? Yes. yes. They have often, and they often, that's part of the deal. 
They nice. often do that. Um, I did that for, um, God, no, it's amazing. But uh, yeah, I've done it many times. Spider-Man probably had one, or Andromeda even. Well, Mass Effect, those games tend to do something like that too. Yeah, Mass time. Effect for sure. So one question a listener wants to know is, when you were brought in to do, quote unquote, additional voices, like say for Mass Effect Andromeda or Halo Wars 2, I know you're in there for a four hour session, but how many voices can they actually have you do when it says additional voices in a session or two or whatever that they bring you in? They can have you up, yeah, to four hours, and I think it's, I believe it's two additional voices. I think it's like two additional voices to the characters that you're doing. Okay. If I'm, if I'm, if I'm right, I think it's two additional voices. So sometimes what they'll have like 30 lines of like villager, you know, villager one, you know, and then they'll have 30 lines of villager two, you know. So you do those, you do, uh, you do maybe a fair amount. But I think it's up to two extra voices. Okay. Um, another one is: Have you had many opportunities to work on your death scream? As many actors have mentioned, how that death scream or screaming in war games tends to be the most killer thing to their voice for a voice actor to do. It's it's absolutely true, and we're asked to do less and less of it than we used to. That's one of the things that came out of all these negotiations. Even though, uh, let's say, we didn't get. The, the kind of the, the residuals that we wanted or whatever, but over the over time, one of the bargaining tr- chips that we had was, you know, that it's very strenuous on the voice. So some of the concessions the other side has made is to reduce the impact on your voice. There are times where it can't be avoided. Uh, the good, the smart directors always leave it to the very end, and maybe you do one or two. Um, they used to push you a lot more. It's it, it, it's it's just not done much anymore. Um, also, the games themselves are more sophisticated, more theatrical, so they tend to be more character driven, more dialogue driven, more cinematic. Uh, they don't rely as much on that. But that being said, if I'm allowed to do the kind of death I want to do, especially with a character that's evil or or insane, it can be really really fun to do. Uh, uh, you know a, 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 a a death scream or a death sound that really is character driven, you know, so that that shows the whimpering weakness of an evil character. For example, his inner core is that he's a bully and he's weak and he's, he's, a, you know, he's, he's, abs- you know, it's to show the, the kind of de- defective personality can come out in that moment of fear and angst before as one dies. So that can be kind of fun actually, but the straight screaming, you know, the, where you just are like you're explode, you're on fire. I love that one. You're burning <laughs> alive. You know, give me 15 seconds of you burning alive. That's that's tough. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, I I love talking to like actors who have, who do like mm-hmm. Dragon Ball Z, and they always mention how their right of passage in there is their first screaming session when they pass out, and then they get the high five like welcome to the show as soon as you get through your first scream session because there's a lot of screaming in that show. And yes. uh, a long, you know, a lot of long is getting. But I know one one change that happened from the '90s to now is um, someone was trying to tell us how, you know, before it used to be like, for example, if you're doing a show like Digimon or Transformers where you transform all the time, it used to be they re-record that brand new every single time a transformation happens. But yes. then Americans came in and said, why don't we just use the same one every time? Because why redo it every single time when it's supposed to sound the same? So then they just looped the same, you know, did it once. Or twice maybe, and then reused it versus every time a new time, a new time. Oh yeah, and I'll, I'll even take it one step further. I remember uh, doing a Japanese show, uh, dubbing a, da- a Japanese show, and they wanted me to, and I was obviously dubbing all the dialogue, and then they wanted me to d- dub uh, this whole screaming sequence, and I was like, w- w- no one's going to know. It's not in Japanese. The guy screaming. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's, and it's a great scream and it matches what I've been doing. Why would you? Know, but they insisted that I do it, I think, just to cover themselves. But it's that kind of thing where you're like, wait a second. I, you know, why? Do, why do I have to do that? You already have this original scream and it doesn't matter. You know, no one's going to know the difference. But like I said, there's less and less of that. Also, if you you learn to to use your diaphragm more than your throat, you learn to when another trick is when you're auditioning. You give them only the level that you're willing to do in the session, and they can take it or leave it. So when they when they buy you, when they hire you, 
they they know that you're only going to do a certain kind of yelling, a certain kind of screaming, and they live with you know they have to accept that. So that's that's another way to protect yourself. Is you 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 kind of set limits on it in the audition. So I know when it comes to video games, especially, you tend to record very isolated. Um, the cast is usually not even in the same city all the time or country, even right. for some of them. But have you ever had an opportunity to record a show or a game where you actually get to record together as a group or have multiple people together in the same room, especially for conversations? Um, yes. Um, I've, I've definitely done that, and uh, it's a lot of fun. Uh, it's always easier for us uh, as the actors um, you get so used to doing your lines completely independently. So you don't even hear the other actors lines. You're reading 300 lines of your dialogue that is completely disconnected from anything else. So you've got your headphones on and you're giving them three, three takes on each line. Uh, maybe like soft, medium, large, you know, like, <laughs> you know, depending on, so they have a little variety, but pretty much, and they'll step in and say, okay, in this scene, this is what's going on. And you're talking to so-and-so and, and, but generally speaking, you don't even hear the other dialogue. So, wow. uh, there's not even like a lead in, uh, so, and then sometimes you're in the, uh, in the room together. Um, uh, I did, uh, a movie, uh, uh, Gary Ross directed uh, with Bill Macy um, was it was an animated movie, and I played the mayor. And, Let's see if I can um, find this. Yeah, I'm spacing. Dude, you got my brain sometimes just fries on the stuff. I'm so bad with names. Uh, Tale of Despero. Tales of Despero. I was just searching for that. Yes, in Tales of Despero, which was really interesting, as Gary Ross said to me, he goes, "Look at what I'm doing." We were on a uh, soundstage at Disney, and he goes. I am recording you guys walking and talking. You're, I'm, we're going to have mics over all of you. We're going to have multiple booms, and you guys are going to act out the scene. Even though this is animation, you're going to act out the scene and walk through the scene and look at each other and deal with each other, and I'm going to just record uh, record the audio. Wow. He goes, can you believe they've never done this before in all the years? I, I, said, I couldn't believe it when I told them I wanted to do this, and they said, well, we've never done that before. And and so that was interesting. I did a scene with Bill Macy, and we were we were walking and talking and improving and playing the scene, and it was great because you know here's a great actor, and you're and you're again, it's like you're doing theater. You're walking around the soundstage, and you're just you know doing your scene together, and they're and they're they've got you uh, on a boom, and um, and then that's what they use to to animate to. So uh, that was pretty cool. Wow. I that, so there's that there's kind of a, another example of of how um, different it can be. You know, some, some directors really want you in the room together. Some don't, some can't. And uh, I, I can do all of it. I'm comfortable with all of it. But it was fun to, you know, Bill, Bill Macy's, a, I'm a big fan. So that was fun to do the scene with him and, and have them record it, us together like that. <laughs> so, uh, you know, this, uh, this list I wanted us to know is, you know, how often do you get to go either – watch or play or see played um, the projects that you've worked on. And have you ever felt sorry for one of the other voice actors uh, when you do it? Such as, for example, you worked in the newer Tomb Raider games where Camilla Ludington has to do death noises over and over and over and over for horrible ways to die throughout that entire series. Uh. <laughs> Like, well, in that game, like she can get impaled, she can hit rocks, she can get burned right, alive, right. she can get shot, and it's a different death noise every time. Right. Uh, have you ever felt sorry for your other cast members, or do you? Or I guess the other part of the question is, do you play or watch your projects when you're done? I do play and watch my projects uh, because oftentimes because of my kids, because they'll send the, the the project over and then my son will play. It's always fun to have your son scream at you from the from the office. <laughs> Um, Dad, I'm I'm fighting you right now, you know. Um, so and 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 his friends are thrilled. So it's always been a big feather in my cap, you know. But yes, I, I do enjoy seeing it. I'm, for example, the director of Days Gone just sent me uh, this beautiful bound book of all the artwork from the show, um, and and wrote a really nice uh, note to me. And uh, and he's an amazing he's an amazing director and was a wonderful guy to work with. And um, we just, uh, you know, I have that on my coffee table, and that's really cool. I can just thumb through that and, and, and see, 
you know, the art, artwork surrounding my scenes and my character. And, but yes, I, they, and sometimes what will happen is when you're working on a, a show long enough, they'll have some of the artwork done from some of the earlier scenes that you've done and they'll start off. They're very excited, obviously, and they'll start off the next session by showing you what they've assembled so far. So it's really beautiful to see. And yes, I do feel sorry for my fellow actors whenever they have to do anything too strenuous. But, you know, it's interesting that you say that because another thing that they've gotten down, and maybe if you were able to listen carefully, you might notice it, is they'll have us do a series of different death noises. You're stabbed, you're slow death, quiet death, loud death, you're hit, you're hitting. And maybe, you know, 15 or 20 of those things. And Generally, they're not as extreme as they used to be. And number two is I think they reuse them a lot. So they might even put a little, um, you know, a little uh, tack on it to, to give it a different sound, uh, maybe change it up a little bit. But generally speaking, um, I think they they reuse a lot of those same death sequences. And they can also cut them. So they'll maybe use a piece of your screen in one and a longer version in another to make it sound differently. So, but it's always the actors are, we're, we're, we're a club. We're tight. You know, we all respect each other and, um, you know, you understand each other totally. And, uh, you're always working with the best people. Um, I know everybody at my agency is, is fantastic and super talented and, you know, Dean Panero talent, which is, uh, uh Dean's the, the best. I, I love him as an agent. And, um, and he has uh, assembled some fantastic people. Also, the people that create it, the people that write it, the people that direct it, the, the engineers in the booth, all those people are wonderful. I, you know, it's, I always say it's, it's such a great job because you walk into these beautiful studios in Burbank. And they look like nothing on the outside. They're completely plain buildings with these bank vault doors and you have to you know, buzz in and you walk in and there are these windowless, opulent dens of you know, recording with private chefs and, you know, beautiful furniture and art designed and beautifully decorated. And, you know, do you want water? Do you want tea? Do you want coffee? Do you want espresso? Do you, you know, whatever you want, you know, do you want a snack? And it's, and they're, and they're just, gorgeously appointed, gorgeously lit, because they've created an environment where people have to spend sometimes days in inside this cave, you know, either recording a game or they're recording uh, commercials or doing ADR in a movie. And so they make it as comfortable as possible. So you've got this beautifully air conditioned, climate controlled, uh, very hip, gorgeously decorated, super comfortable environment. And, uh, you know, a lot of them, like I said, have a chef and they make you lunch or they're always bringing snacks in. And so we're treated really, really well at the end of the day. It's a, it's a pretty good gig, you know. So uh, another listener question they want to know, uh, in Star Wars Battlefront Renegade Squadron, you got to voice Admiral Akbar. I was not aware that someone not named Con Tom Kane voiced Admiral Akbar at that time. Can you still do that voice? What was it like doing Admiral Akbar, a known character from Return of the Jedi? Oh my God. I, I enjoy doing it. I don't remember the voice that I use. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so bad. Do you have a reference? And I could do it if I heard the reference. Uh, Renegade Squadron. Let's I see if I can I'm, find I, that one. I don't, so, even, I don't remember what one that is. Um, my kids are so, are like, you are so lame. You don't, you don't well, remember anything. I go, I've done so many of these things. Well, like, you've done so many voices that, yeah, I don't know if I'm going to be able to find it. Akbar, Renegade Squadron One. I, I see playthroughs, and that's going to take a long time. I, I guarantee you, <laughs> definitely. I know. I I, I, guarantee, I guarantee you, I definitely enjoyed playing the character, though. Um, so because I, I I remember that was a well written character. Um, let's see. I'm gonna I'm, I'm trying to see ones that we have not already covered something similar. For. Oh, here's one. In Age of Empires 3, you got to be a very important historical figure in the United States. You got to be Colonel George Washington. That's right. What do you do to prepare to be Colonel George Washington, a character I've only remember seeing played one other time in a game, and that was Assassin's Creed? It seems to be a rather hard character to prepare for because you can offend a lot of people really easily. <laughs> exactly. And, and, and I think uh, you hit it right on the head. Is You can't push it. You can't, you've got like everything else in acting, it's got to come from a real place. 
You you know, you want to have real emotion and then you don't want to push it too much. So you, it's more of a, a, of a feeling or a flavor or kind of a zone that you're working from. So who is this guy? Is he, he's, he's dignified, but he's not omnipotent. He's still human. He's going through, uh, in the game, he's going through the war. So he doesn't really know what's going to happen next. And you, you start to develop kind of a, a sense of, uh, integrity. I think was where I was working from uh, and a timber to the voice that says uh, there's an eloquence to it and a, a certain kind of uh, intrinsic command without being pompous. So you try to find those things. You try to find um, kind of a truth that has a, a very firm underpinning that lends itself to the idea of Washington, but is still a real character. It's still a real person. And, and then you have to make sure you're not pushing towards some ideal, you know, because that will read phony and forced. Nice. So it is difficult to find it. I think I'm, I'm hired a lot because I can kind of do a mid Atlantic classic sort of speech, you know, and I have a sort of uh, tone and speech that lends itself to that um, and comes from that mid Atlantic place. And it, it can come off kind of educated or, you know, um, aristocratic in a way or uh, someone in authority from an earlier time when things were more formal. So that's kind of where I go. I go in, into that place. Um, so let's see. We have one more listener question. And they said, I've seen how fully work happens when they make sound effects for games and movies. Um, and it looks very complicated. When you do ADR, is it similar to how fully does their stuff? It, it's it's interesting that they said that because there's always a Foley uh, 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 pad next to you, which is they always have one in the corner, you know, which is, you know, with a different hardwood floor, you know, uh, artificial grass, sand, you know, where, you, where they can make the different foot noises. So it's always it's funny that you mentioned that because the ADR studios all have those in them. But no, ADR is uh, you you speak on your um, on your third beep. Um, uh actually the fourth beep. Um, so it comes in in beeps and they've lined up the beeps so that the fourth beep lands exactly where you not, you need to start speaking to match the picture. You've got the picture on a big screen you're the, in front of you on the, on the wall in front of you, usually about 20, 25 feet away. It's almost like full movie size screen. And then you're the only one standing in the recording um, studio and you're standing at a, at the mic um, with your headphones, and then there's a crew inside behind the glass in the in the booth, and the director's there, and uh, the engineers are there, and they're guiding you through it in terms of your tonality and how they want you to play it, and whether you're matching, but your timing. So our the difference is, or the similarity is that we're both working on a timing from a timing uh, uh, place, uh, a timing perspective. So uh, Foley, yes, has to match within the frames of, of the film and be precise, as do we. But other than that, we're we're really watching lip movement and trying to hit just the right sound at just the right time. It's it's easier when it's yourself. Um, but I've done both. I've ADR'd myself, and uh, I've I've done pickups for myself, and I've in, in movies I've been in, TV shows I've been in, and I've also done it where I'm dubbing out someone else so so which is more complicated when you're dubbing something and you have to match you know speed and try to translate it as well or when you're doing adr over english we have to literally match the mouth or else it will not it will not work yeah i think the dubbing dubbing out is 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 harder and even if you're doing english but you're but you're replacing another actor's voice which i've done or if you're doing a voice match where you're um, where you're replicating the actor's voice, you're picking up a couple of lines because they're too busy to do it or whatever, and they've hired you because you're a voice match, and you come in and I've done that, you know, I've done celebrity voice match where I'm actually picking up and ADRing certain lines from their latest movie um, and saving them the trouble and doing it. So that's more difficult. And also the voice match, when you're doing voice matching, that's the most difficult. I'd say, I'd say that's even more difficult than doing foreign, a foreign language job. 
especially if someone has a interesting way of talking. <laughs> you know, like yeah, I, I imagine like it's not necessarily Steve Buscemi, but you know, someone with an interesting like the way their mouth forms would be a lot harder to voice match or you know ADR over than someone who um, you know, not talks normal, but you know right. has a more standard way of talking. Exactly. Um, so um, there's there's you know that you're trying to you're trying to match not only their voice but their tonality their rhythm uh people different actors play the line differently break up the line differently use different they're, they're not using the punctuation they've created their own gaps uh i, I so i do liam neeson a lot and uh, i'll do I, i've come in and dubbed him and it's it, once for him it's easier for me in the sense because i can get I can latch onto the accent, but it's also matching his timing, his pauses, his breathing. Those things are, are difficult. Could we hear some like, Neeson so people could, like, is this like full on, like, is, oh, is it Scottish accent Neeson or is he I mean, Irish, Irish, Irish yeah, accent Neeson or is this like his American accent when you do it? Like, could we hear some Neeson? Oh, okay. Uh, yeah, sure. Um, if you ever want to make it back, I'm going to have to tell you to go now or else look over your shoulder for the rest of your life. Nice. Nice. And so when nice. they when they do commercials for with niece and movies, you can do, you know, the, the extra lines in the commercials that might not be done yet. Correct. Yeah, correct. Or I'll do the yeah, I'll do that. Or maybe they just need to do a pickup of a couple of lines and they, and he's shooting another movie somewhere and they, he's not going to come back and do like two lines in an ADR session or four lines in an ADR session. So I'll do those. Nice. You know, if they need Qui-Gon, they can always just add you and you know, <laughs> exactly that is a voice match. Well, that's fantastic. Um, so, you know, before we wrap everything up, you know, if people want to follow your work and get hold of, you know, maybe or to see what you're up to and, and so on, where do you recommend they go? Well, I, I definitely have a um, uh, I, I have a Twitter account, so if they want to tweet, I'm I'm always happy to tweet back. I'd love to do that. Um, uh, I usually announce stuff that I'm doing or that's been released. I'm kind of a little remiss. I don't think I uh, announced Days Gone on my Twitter account, but it's uh, at Mr. Daniel Reardon. Mr. Daniel Reardon. Mm -hmm. That's and awesome. I only used the Mr. because Dan, for some reason somebody else had Daniel Reardon, which was upsetting. So I had to put the Mr. in. <laughs> well, I've seen lots of other people put their name and then put V O at the end or something like that because of, right. of similar things. Like I, I, at least your name is unique enough that there's probably not 400 people with that name. But exactly. <laughs> and you know, I'm, I'd be happy to communicate with anybody that reaches out and. Um, I'm a little shy on Twitter. I tend to I, I follow my friends on it, I, and I watch people and I, I see what they're doing, and uh, you know what movies they're directing or producing or what shows they're on or games they're coming out with or whatnot. But uh, I tend to be uh, you know a little reticent. Um, but uh, I would definitely engage anybody that reached out to me. So I think it was from your Twitter that I followed something that DC Douglas was doing one time. Was oh yeah, that was last last year. He did. Yeah. Uh, uh, we were together at the uh, TF Nation. Ah, yes. In, in Birmingham, England, and he was doing his very funny uh, comedy night sketch that he does, and uh, and it was very funny. So uh, I I did a shout out for him because I went, so I was very impressed. At conventions, I I've seen it quite a few times. Usually, when it involves when uh, Paulson and well when. Uh, and Jesse and so on. When the when the Animaniacs show up, they like to do these panels where they like to do uh, scenes with voice actors, and they but they say you know, for example, they do Harry Potter, but they just do them in their voices instead, changing them every time. Have you ever been participating in a panel like that at conventions? No, I haven't. Uh, the the convention the, last year we they simply interviewed me, uh, but that's what DC was doing. He was doing. Um, he had a voice. He was doing something in character, and, and it was very, it was very risque. It was very funny. <laughs> I can believe DC um, Douglas doing risque things. <laughs> yeah, he pushes the envelope a little bit. But he's him and John St. John. I, I, nothing surprises me when they do things. Oh my God! Yeah, and then, exactly. And he's uh, he's hysterical. So 
you know, everybody loved it, and it, it, it was a real addition to the to the convention. And then his booth was right next to mine, and and we're also at the same agency, and we've known each other forever. In fact, DC Douglas years ago, he used to on the side, he used to cut people's uh, reels, you know, their audition reels, you know, their, their before before people had websites and, and and that kind of thing. You'd actually have a VHS tape that you would uh, give to agents, give to producers that had all your work on it. Um, all your on-camera work, and he uh, edited my. He, he put that one together one one year. Wow. Years. Ago. Yeah, he, he was uh, he was in charge of that, and he did a great job. Yeah, he's very talented. And he's another one. If people want to follow someone on Twitter, he's a great one to follow because he actually he might not be on Twitter right now. He might have gotten in trouble, but follow him on social media when you can find him. <laughs> he's a great one to follow because he's just he he doesn't hold back. No, no, and I I said to him before I go. You know, you've got to watch the politics because it's. You know, I've gotten a. I, I had. I got a job recently, and um, uh, to to do the voice for a bank, and they were going to hire me. They're going to hire me, and the last thing they did is they called my agents and they said, uh, to "Ask him if we can go on look at his social media because everything's good, but we need to check his social media before we say yes." And I was like, go for it because, you know, I'm lame. I don't really do much social media. And, um, and even if I did, I would, I would be very circumspect about, uh, you know, my, my personal life, my politics, et cetera, for this very reason. So they went and they looked at it and I was clean and they hired me. But someone like DC, I don't know, you know, depending on what he's saying that week, you may not get the gig. You know, it's, 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 you got to watch, you know, I hate to say you got to watch what you, what you say, but, I, it's each to his own. I mean, I certainly uh, have firm beliefs, but yeah, you know, I, I think about my business and especially when you're doing advertising, I mean, you have to appeal to a lot of different kinds of people and represent a company and, you know, that can be difficult if you're, if, if you're known for being <laughs> too, too much of one thing. <laughs> Fantastic. Thank you oh, so well. much. No, Jeremiah, thank you. I, it was a, a very flattering. It was a real pleasure. I'm sorry about my uh, delay the last, you know, the first two times. I apologize for that. That that's perfectly okay. I under, I understand that you know, you had a fire one of the days, um, right? And yeah, it's the, it's that season. We just need a lot of rain, a lot of rain. Yes, a lot of rain. Well, it's been great talking to you. Likewise, this is awesome. I'm familiar with so much of your work that it, the hardest part for me when I talk to people like you or Yuri or people who've worked on tons of stuff that I have listened to and watched. To figure out what to talk about, like which thing to talk about, because I can talk about all of it. I know, and I, you know, I, I love it because some, like, I, maybe it's better with these guys. They might know more, but sometimes after a while, you know, you've been doing it so long, you've been doing like so many games, so many projects that you start to forget, you know, what you've done, and you know. Yeah, it's definitely. Yeah, I've definitely talked to people that have forgotten they worked on entire like series of games. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad I'm not the only one because I'm sitting here going, "Oh my god, I sound like I'm you know has have Alzheimer's or something." I think one of them. I think I want to say Corey Burton was one of them because we were talking about like some of his really old Disney stuff he's worked on, and then mm -hmm. I mentioned some really old games and like I, I worked on that. I didn't live there, did I? <laughs> That's so funny. <laughs> Unless anyone who's done this for a long time, I imagine Steve Bloom has forgotten more of what he's worked on than he's worked than he remembers because he's. Done, yeah, done so much. Yeah, so probably. But it's it, that's what makes it so fun because you guys can literally fit in almost any fandom anywhere, and uh, you know, you imagine I imagine you can sit at a convention and people will come up to you with a random image to talk to you or sign and be like, "Did I do that? Yep. Oh, yeah, it, yeah." And yeah. it's all it was really fun in in, in uh, TF Nation to to have them come up with the Star Trek stuff, and they had beautiful photographs, beautiful glossy pictures, you know, uh, that they'd gotten from the shows and. And I loved playing, um, you know, the Klingon, my, my, my favorite, you know, Klingon. So um, that was really a blast, I got to say. That was fun that they got they, they dug that. And, you know, you've even been in Scooby-Doo, even though I have to admit it's, it's, a, nice. it's a Scooby-Doo movie that I forgot happened because, like, my son owns, I don't know, we just bought him, like, eight more Scooby-Doo movies the other day. Mm -hmm. But I forgot there was that CG one in the middle between kind of. That's right. And that was, uh, that was directed by Brian Levant. Who was my creator producer on Captain Zoom, The Adventures of Captain Zoom in Outer Space, which I did in '95 for Stars Universal. Wow! And that's an that's a live action 
You should look, take a look at that sometime. Your, your, by the way, your kids will love that show. My kids loved it. I had it on DVD and they just couldn't watch enough of it. Captain it Zoom, you said? It's called The Adventures of Captain Zoom in Outer Space. And it came out in 95 as a, a, a movie of the week. It was going to be a series. And then uh, there was a political battle between Universal and Stars, and it got canned before it started. But it was already got really high ratings, and they'd already written 26 episodes. And it was going to be the third part of the action pack with Hercules and Xena cool. at the time of the biggest shows in the world. Yeah. It's for your time, but in 95. I, I remember Xena. I definitely remember Xena. Yeah, oh, of course. <laughs> and you got to work with Ron Perlman yeah. apparently in this one. Uh, Michelle Nichols. Well, that's a Star Trek name for you. Um, that's right. Wow. Oh yeah. Mm-hmm. And that's a. I, I play Captain Zoom. I was the lead, and it's very funny. It's very cute, and you're going to see that another show completely ripped us off, and the show was in the next bungalow over at Universal, and. Uh, so another movie came out kind of based pretty much on what we'd done with that show. When it didn't go, they went and made the movie. Hmm. So um, I should watch it and find out if I can figure it out off the top of my head. And if not, IMDb Trivia might know. There you go. <laughs> but uh, so Your kids will love that show. I think he will. He is definitely yeah. into this sort of thing right now. Yeah, it's very cute. Well, thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah, uh, we're definitely going to check this one out. Let's see if I can find it on streaming. Oh, well, I'll let you go, and then I'll search for it on streaming. But thank you so much for your time and all this, and I will definitely send this to you as soon as this is live. And, uh, you know, Days Gone, Mass Effect, all of them, great work that you've done over the years, and I know you're going to do a lot of great stuff coming soon, even if I don't understand what the heck this thing about Bakersfield, <laughs> Bakersfield War is. <laughs> <laughs> My family lives in Bakersfield. Like, I have tons and tons and tons of cousins in Bakersfield, and it's hot and sweaty and kind of dirty but it is biggest field noir looks like it's well it's interesting yeah yeah <laughs> and that's your current project right or at least uh, the next one yeah this i'm doing something yeah there's this and i just i just did nancy drew mysteries too Ooh. which is fun um but yeah i've got yeah i've got a, a couple of different things going on usually we can't talk about them yeah so. you have the ndas that you yes. should definitely follow um, yes I don't want to get you in trouble. So, but yeah, we look forward to seeing what you're doing in the future and uh, perhaps having you on again to talk uh, some more of uh, any time. Awesome yeah, you were great. And I enjoyed speaking with you And anytime. any time.